attention today to the word of the Lord as it's found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. For you yourselves know, brethren, that our visit to you was not in vain. For though we had already suffered and been shamefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we had courage in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in the face of great opposition. For our appeal does not spring from error or uncleanness, nor is it made with guile. But just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak, not to please men, but to please God who tests our hearts. For we never used either words of flattery, as you know, or a cloak for greed, as God is witness. Nor did we seek glory from men, whether from you or from others, that we might have made demands as apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, like a nurse taking care of her children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, because you had become very dear to us. For you remember our labor and toil, brethren. We worked night and day that we might not burden any of you while we preached to you the gospel of God. You are witnesses, and God also, how holy and righteous and blameless was our behavior to you believers. For you know how, like a father with his children, we exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you to lead a life worthy of God, who calls you into his kingdom and glory. And we also thank God constantly for this, that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God. For it is at work in you believers. <clears throat> you, brethren, became imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus, which are in Judea. For you suffered the same things from your own countrymen as did they did from the Jews, who killed both the Lord Jesus and the prophets, and drove us out and displeased God and opposed all men by hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles that they may be saved. So as always to fill up the measure of their sins, for God's wrath has come upon them at last. We'll end our reading there. One of the poignant moments of this week was to have had an opportunity to get glimpses of Jeb Stuart Magruder on the witness stand before the Senate Select Committee. To see a fine, well-groomed, brilliant young man attempt to explain before a Senate committee, before the press, and before the eyes of the nation, how he had perjured himself and how deeply he regretted what he had done, and then to see him begin to make a clean breast, so far as we're able to see, of those things which had been kept locked within him for these months. One of the saddest scenes that I think television brought out of that moment was in those particular instances where the television camera panned the view of both Magruder and his wife. His wife was sitting behind him. And her face was dour and, and sad. And it seemed as if for, at any moment tears would come to her eyes. No smiles. Just gloom. Beautiful young wife who has been affected by what her husband did. And I think as I watched that, that I began to realize the significance of the difference in, that often occurs in our lives between what we desire to be and what we actually are and what happens when we have actually terribly, miserably failed. Someone has written, it was James Berry, a Scottish writer, who said, The life of everyone is a diary in which he means to write one story and instead writes another. And his saddest hour is when he compares the volume as it is with what he vowed to make it. I've been, a, in my youth, a keeper of diaries. I sometimes, for amusement's sake, go back to read some of the dreams that I had written. Hopefully some of them are coming to pass. But in a sense, I think your life and mine has had its moments when what we desire to be has not been. Therefore, the word of the Lord is so vital for us this day. Because we come face to face with an individual who has the Spirit of God resting on him, whose life is consistent with his dreams, who is the same person in secret as he is in public, who has learned the story and the way to really be happy 
and successful in his life, the Apostle Paul. It's as if in this second chapter of Thessalonians that he opens his life as a book for us all to read and see, that out of it we may derive truths to apply to our own life so that genuine enjoyment and enrichment of our personal experience can take place. You know, this man, Paul, has an incredible success story. It's seen here in this Thessalonian letter. Can you imagine going into a major city like he did, the town of Thessalonica, a crossroads city between east and west through which the major highway of its day ran, a city in which there were no believers at all, and simply with two other individuals he goes into the town, and within a few months, a whole large community of believers have emerged. What an incredible story. What he is therefore sharing in this chapter is a story of success, not an external kind of success by which the world measures it, but a success in terms of how God measures it. Success in communicating our faith. Success in being able to live with yourself. Success in being able to live with other people. Let's look at the story of this man, of God, and see what is in his life that happens to touch on ours. One thing that we see at the beginning of this second chapter is that here is a person, like all persons who are really in contact with God, a person who has a purpose. He indicates as he opens the second chapter, you yourselves know, brethren, that our visit to you was not in vain. That word vain or in vain in its original setting came to be used of an individual who, uh, or, or of a purpose that was empty in character, that had no meaning. And uh, it could be used also of a person who just uh, hadn't found a direction in life who uh, frittered away his time in pursuits that were meaningless. Paul says that when he walked into this town, he did not come in vain. That is, he didn't come guessing what he was going to do next or letting life happen to him. He experienced a clear, single motivation of purpose as he walked into that town. And that motivation was to bring the gospel of God to persons who, in that community like our community, so much needed good news in their life. His purpose was so strong that he was able to maintain his purpose in spite of previous sufferings and in spite of present challenges. He indicates that there were things that threatened his survival. We already suffered and had been shamefully treated at Philippi, he says. And Acts chapter 16 tells us what he'd gone through. He'd been very badly beaten in the town. And he'd been locked in prison. And at midnight, he and Silas, his co-partner, were singing praises to God. He had, been, he had suffered physically and he'd been shamefully treated. That is to say, mentally, he had known anguish for his expression of faith. When you turn the scripture over a few pages to 2 Corinthians chapter 11... Uh, that letter being written several years after this, you find Paul saying things like five times he had been beaten with the 39 lashes, they had been shipwrecked three times, that a day and a night he'd been out on sea, that he was in constant danger for his life. He knew what it was to have his purpose tested in life. And as a Christian, you will find that everything you want to do for God is going to go through a period of tremendous testing. And the purpose of that testing is to cause inner strength in you to be able to help you stand. God never allows anyone in His kingdom to exist without their being tested. And here is a person before us who can take the worst of physical and mental abuse and not lose his purpose. And not say, I'm going to sit this next one out. What if Paul had come to the city of Thessalonica after he left Philippi and gathered a group of people together and said, I want to tell you how much I have suffered for Jesus. It laughed him out of town. He hadn't come to tell the bad things that happened to him. He had come to tell the good news of the gospel. And he came to that town not willing to simply say, well, I remember how the lash hurts. And I don't want to have to go through that again. I think we who aren't persecuted sometimes lose the feeling of what it must be like to be bodily abused for the sake of a relationship with Jesus Christ. And it's no funny or pleasant thing 
to have someone beating you within an inch of your life. And yet, here is this individual, Paul, who doesn't know the meaning of the word defeat. How in relief we ought to set his example with our own. How easily it is for us within the comfy setting of 20th century American Christianity to let the criticism of an individual slow us down and say, well, if that's the way people are going to be, well, see if I'll be involved. Or to let a defeat or a failure or a sin in our life be such that we refuse to come back from it. That our, our vision and our purpose just absolutely collapses in the midst of pressure. Here's a purpose that can be sustained through defeat and a purpose that can surmount present challenges. He says in respect to his treatment uh, at Thessalonica, we had courage in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in the face of great opposition. Paul knew what was coming at Thessalonica the minute he stood up to preach. And indeed it happened. He was persecuted in that town as well. In fact, a riot broke out. And again, his life was put in jeopardy. He says, we had courage to present to you the gospel of God in the face of great opposition. The word for opposition in the original language is the word agony. Agony, it's the same word. And it was a word that was associated with sports contests. And uh, in a sports contest, the one who exerted himself to win was the one of whom agony could be used. He wrought his victory through agony. And Paul is saying, in his experience in this town, the presentation of the gospel of the Lord had involved great agony, personal cost, but he had courage in God. Not a self-courage, not a worked up, pumped up enthusiasm, but it was because that what he believed is the good news and is the truth that he had power to declare it. A purpose that was firm could survive past defeats and it could surmount present challenges. God causes us to have a faith like this. There's another reason, however, why the Apostle Paul is, is a person who is able to be at home with himself and live a life that is fruitful and effective and enjoyable for God. He is the person, as verses 3 through 6 indicate, he is a person of unimpeachable character. There were some individuals, evidently unbelievers, remaining at this town of Thessalonica in northern Greece who were bringing some rather subtle criticisms against the Apostle Paul. So he gives indication that his life is an open book before all, that he has not committed perjury. He says, for one thing, our appeal does not, does not come from error. That is to say, Paul's saying a very true thing about the gospel. That when he came to declare the good news of Jesus Christ, he was not wondering whether or not it was true. And he was not just giving a part truth. The gospel of Jesus Christ conforms to things as they really are. Jesus said, they that worship the Father must worship him in spirit and in truth. It's not simply, well, if you're sincere, it'll be all right. That would be maybe in a, a spirit, spirit with an uncapitalized S. But what we believe must be in truth. Just because you're sincere does not mean you're right. No one could be more sincere to lay down his life for the gospel than the Apostle Paul. But sincerity did not prove a thing. It had to be right. It had to be true. The gospel was not in error. It was not, neither did his appeal come from uncleanness. And the word there is immorality. You can see how easily this charge can be made because, after all, at Thessalonica, a number of leading women of the city had been converted. And what's more, Paul tells the Thessalonians to greet one another with a kiss of peace. And you could see how people who weren't believers and began hearing strange things about these crazy Christians in the town. Well, did you hear that a great part of their congregation are converted women or, and, and they greet one another with a kiss of peace and the pagans could imagine all kinds of things happening? Well, after all, that was like religion was in Thessalonica anyway. Two of the major mystery religions of the ancient world were headquartered there. Sex symbols dominated the town. And Paul says, in the gospel of Jesus Christ, not only are our heads clean, we've got truth, it's not from error, but our hearts are clean as well. Not from uncleanness. Also, Paul says, our appeal to, to you didn't come from guile. You remember, Thessalonians, that I didn't try to con you into becoming a believer. 
uh, cheap strategies to win people to the Lord uh, perhaps uh, produce uh, cheap disciples. To come to Jesus Christ must be a decision which you fundamentally want to make with all your heart. And it can't come through someone conning you or tricking you or fearing you or scaring you into a belief with Jesus Christ. Not with guile. The fact that it's not of guile comes because his message is so utterly from God. Verse 4, we have been approved by God and entrusted with the gospel. Notice that the approval of God comes before Paul is entrusted. That phrase approval means that Paul was put through the test of personal experience and God, in that period of testing, determined that here was a man whom he could entrust were the gospel, so that Paul said, we sought to please God rather than men. That is, the first goal of my preaching was to remember that the person whom I'm most concerned about is what God is thinking about what I say. So I don't preach to be a crowd pleaser. I don't preach to trick people into belief. But I preach essentially to God and of God. And what we hold and share together as Christians must be rooted in this very basic, stark honesty of what is said and done within the life of an individual believer. Paul goes on to indicate that his conduct is unimpeachable because it does not proceed from flattery. I doubt if Paul came into the town and gathered a few people together and said, you wonderful Thessalonians, wonderful people like you ought to have a wonderful gospel like mine. I'm sure that he loved these people. That's deeply seen here in this letter. But I'm sure also he had to say some very hard and true things. He had to talk about the fact that there is none that is righteous. No, not one. He had to suggest and say and teach that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. In other words, if the gospel was to have any effect at all, it had to come in truth and not flattery. And the very basic tenet of the gospel is that none of us on our own can please God or to be brought into a living relationship with Him. That there is only the way that Jesus Christ has provided whereby God accepts His life as a substitute for ours. And once we accept Jesus, we have pleased God and are no longer in the standpoint of being recognized as a sinner in God's presence, but He elevates us to the position of His Son and His heir. And Paul had to say that at Thessalonica, as I say it this morning. It was not through flattery. By telling good people to be better. Rather, he was telling people who were lost that they could be found. By God. Not only was the gospel not through flattery, but he did not proceed from a cloak of greed. He didn't preach in order to get a good offering to carry out of the town so he could take it to the next place. In fact, I doubt if he even gave away autographed copies of his, uh, autographed copies of his epistle. He could, I would like to have had an autographed copy of Paul's epistle. I would have been glad to have given him an offering for that. But never once did he seek to bilk. This is such a contrast with the roving sophist teachers of the ancient world who's, who were in teaching because it was a way, uh, it was a profession. It, it, uh, you were there to get paid. Paul says, I didn't do this to get paid. Indeed, uh, I worked in order to bring the gospel to you. He'll go on to say, not as a cloak for greed. I, I'm not related to you because I want your money. And he further affirms that what he does is not to seek glory from men. He's involved in the ministry of Jesus Christ and in the work of Jesus Christ, not for recognition. What a, again, a beautiful pattern of behavior this suggests for all of you who are actively involved in ministries within this church or in outside of this church with other believers. To do it, whether there's recognition or not, in fact, to do it not for the sake of recognition. Paul says, whatever I did wasn't so that men could point to me and say, hey, you're a number one guy, you're really dedicated. Nor did he try to throw his weight around. He says, um, we might have made demands of you as apostles of Christ, but we didn't. We didn't try to throw our importance around, our weight around. We didn't try to throw titles on you or anything like that. No, an unimpeachable conduct. The Lord, you see, creates within us a clean heart and pure motives. And uh, you know as well as I that there is no happiness or enjoyment of life if your motives are not clean and if your heart is not pure and if you're trying to live on both sides of the fence, balancing your private life against your public life. 
an utter cleanness inside is a characteristic of enjoying life. The third thing that Paul had in relationship to the Thessalonians that can be ours as well is not only did he have a purpose and an unimpeachable conduct, but he had a genuine love for people. And that's seen in the two models of relationship that he traces here in this letter. He says, I was among you gentle as a nurse taking care of her children. And then he goes on later to talk about his being a father. Verse uh, 7 says, we were gentle among you. The King James at this point reads babes. Uh, probably the, 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 the best meaning here is gentle. We were gentle among you as a nurse taking care of her children. I'd underline that word, her children, because this may infer that the children are not just somebody else's that the nurse is taking care of, but the children are really hers, and she is nursing them. And this suggests that one of the beautiful relationships in this letter of the Thessalonians is that it shows a close, warm, happy, emotional, loving relationship with other people. I uh, looked around to see if my children were here. As soon as they are in the adult service, I'll have to quit using them as illustrations, but I'll keep getting by as long as they're in children's church. Our little girl Evangelist is now six, and she's not quite as cuddly as she used to be, I think, somehow, when they get about first or second grade. You still, you know, love them and hug them and all that, but they, they're just, they're not quite cuddly anymore. But Georgie is still cuddly. And... Um, you just run over, any time of day you feel like just walking over and just grabbing them and hugging them and kissing them and, you know, just interrupting the routine. Whatever. It's just something magnet that draws you there. And that's kind of how Paul says he was relating to these Thessalonian believers. He loved them so much he just felt like putting his arms around them, but really caring for them. That was his ad incredible attitude. He, he wasn't some stiff theologian who was saying, I've got a, a, a doctrine I want you to believe. But he had a heart and shows this tremendous relationship uh, toward others as a nurse taking care of her own children. I think Paul was a person who, uh, teenagers I think would appreciate this, he knew how to fall in love quick. And he fell hard when he fell in love. And uh, by the way, when he fell in love, he stayed in love. He was only with these believers a few months, at the most, a few months. And yet he says, we were affectionately desirous of you. And he says, um, you became very dear to us. Now I ask you, is that how you feel toward other people in this body of believers? If you're a regular part of this church, are you affectionately desirous of one another? And does a concern for another person become very dear to you? The Lord wants us to have that kind of relationship with each other. Boy, how this word searches me out as well as I'm sure it searches us all out. God wants us to be in love with one another. And a love which suggests maybe even a motherly concern for each other if necessary. Right? Paul's not only a nursing mother among these people, not only willing to share with them intellectual truth, but also his own life. But he's also a father. And since this is Father's Day, I suppose this text is very fitting because... It means that I didn't preach... A, I'm always reluctant to preach a special Father's Day message. Much easier to speak on Mother's Day. Uh, but since I'm a father, I'm extremely uh, reluctant to preach special Father's Day sermons. <clears throat> I tried to bring my dad in to do that, but he wasn't available this year. But I can say a few things here about a father, because that's another relationship of love that Paul has to these Thessalonian believers. And as a father, Paul shows a characteristic of, first of all, working. He says, you remember our labor and toil. The word labor, uh, in the language which Paul is using, comes from a, a verb which meant to strike. And, and because the verb meant to strike, in the noun form, it meant a blow. And gradually the word came to mean in its noun form the kind of effort that is produced in either giving a blow or in receiving a blow. And Paul, we know from Acts chapter 18, was a tent maker. And it was hard work. Labor and toil. A lot of sweat. A lot of grind. And, and work night and day. He probably got up while it was still night. Still dark out. Began his tent making work. Worked on it in the early morning. Laid that aside. Began witnessing. Visited homes at night. But he worked as a father. He set an example. Now he's going to have to tell 
these Thessalonians in chapter 5 to get to work and not be idle. As a father, he had shown them that work is important. He taught them the value of hard work. No believer, in fact, no unbeliever, can enjoy life if you're lazy. I defy you to enjoy life if you're lazy. You might enjoy it for a few days. But you are sick, mentally, if you enjoy being lazy. You really are. You've got to have something to do. You know what Jesus said? Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Oh, great. We're going to get asleep. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. How does Jesus give rest? By finding the right job for us to do that fits us well. Maybe the only thing you can do at this point in your life in terms of work is to show some kindness toward another person or to pray. Others of you, because of age and ability, can do a whole lot more. But work is a quality that Paul had. It's a quality that expresses love. Not only is work a quality, but Paul indicates that he has had a character which is unblemished in the presence of these Thessalonian believers. He is holy, verse 10, holy, righteous, and blameless. Holy shows that as a father he's devoted to God. Righteous shows that he doesn't fall below any certain line of behavior. And unblameable or blameless shows that no one can fault him as a person. He has lived the gospel. And then Paul indicates that he talked to his children. As a father, he talked to them. And what did he say when he talked? Well, he said, I exhorted you. And that means he said, hey, here's what you ought to be doing. Here's the kind of life you ought to be living. And so he taught them to live that. And it also says that Paul, as a father, encouraged them. That word encouraged is only found three times in the New Testament. That particular word, which in the original language stands behind this. And the other two times it's found is in John chapter 11. And it's in reference to to Mary and Martha being encouraged after the death of Lazarus. And in that context, the word meant to console. And that's what a father does lots of times. Kids come in crying, and they're bruised and hurt, and somebody needs to encourage them, to sit down and love them and kiss them and care for them and listen to their problems. And Paul says, as a father, this is what I did. And that suggests a relationship of believers to one another, that we have that kind of a role where we console one another from time to time. And then Paul says... I charged you to lead a life worthy of God. And to charge means to solemnly declare. The King James, I think, translates it better there. He says, I charged you to walk worthily of God. The verb means to walk. And some 50 times in the New Testament, the verb to walk is used in reference to our relationship to God. Do you have a walk with God? Scriptures say, Enoch walked with God and was not for God took him. And a little Sunday school girl went home and told her mother and says, Enoch used to take long walks with God. And one day they were out on a walk and they walked so far that God said, we've come too far. Don't go back. You might as well come along with me. <clears throat> How do you take a walk with a person? You go for a walk with a person. What do you do? Well, you both go in the same direction, I hope. And to walk with God means you know the direction He's going. <laughs> Where is God going? Look at Jesus. Now, Jesus was going away from sin. He was going away from unrighteousness. And uh, Jesus was going to the way of the cross, to the way of suffering, to the way of truth, to the Father. And if you walk, you also uh, take a step at a time. In your experience, in a walk as a Christian, you don't take a few steps and then stop and say, I think I'll stop for a while. It's walking is too exerting. Or I think I'll lie down. You know, How, how easy it is to live the Christian life by the herk and jerk. Uh, the preacher herks you up and go along or somebody else. You know, what, what, what is looked for in life is a consistency. You know, and every time you take a step, you just about fall down for a moment. You know, if that leg didn't land, you would fall down. And walking can be defined as avoiding a fall. Walking with God, progressively, step by step, neither running nor sleeping nor laying down, but going with Him. That's the kind of day-to-day -day practical living that had been experienced at Thessalonica. God is calling you into His kingdom and glory. That's why we walk worthily.
Paul also shows this ability to enjoy life, to get the most out of it, by his thanksgiving to God. We've seen how what a tremendously thankful person he is in chapter 1. But here again, the theme is addressed. He thanks the Lord for two things. That the Word of God has been received by the believers of Thessalonica. And it's been received not as the Word of a man, but as it really is the Word of God. Paul says, you received and accepted the Word. The word received simply means somebody hands something to you. But the word accepted is the same word that was used in Paul's culture to refer to the kind of a way that a person had when a guest came to his house. He accepted the guest, which means he made the guest feel welcome and right at home. And that's the, our, our response to the Word of God. We make the Word of God feel right at home. Lord Jesus, come right on in. With your teaching and with your law, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be right here in my life. There's a beautiful uh, article written by Robert Munger. Some of you may have read it. It's gotten nationwide distribution. Uh, my Heart, Christ Home. Where he talks about the various compartments in our life. And uh, one of the compartments that we find sometimes most difficult to give to God is the compartment of our heart, where we turn it over. Maybe another is the compartment of their mind. Another, the compartment of, of their feelings. Another, the compartment of their doing, their hands and their feet. But all of it, the Word is at home. The Word of God, not the Word of men, but the Word of God, and that Word of God is at work in you. It works. The word which Paul uses for works Work is the word from which we get energy. It's the same word. Energy. The word is that energy in you. And that word in the New Testament is only used of a supernatural source. Never of human energy. It's either satanic or godly energy. And what Paul is simply saying is that when you walk into the doorway of receiving Jesus Christ and begin welcoming the word into your life, not simply reading it as a duty or reading it in a hurry, but taking the time to really welcome it and say... Oh, that's a tremendous word. I, I will act on that. I will take that in. When that happens, you'll find a supernatural power at work in your life. An energy which effectively change you, changes you. There is an energy crisis in Christians when the word is left undrilled for. There is no energy crisis when the word is being welcomed. It is at work. Another thing Paul gives thanks for for, in addition to the Word being at work, is that these believers have become imitators of Jesus Christ, of Paul, and of others who have suffered for faith in Jesus. And Paul goes on to articulate the very much difficulty he's had among his own fellow people in witnessing for the gospel. I suppose in looking at it that persecution provides three positive things. When one is persecuted for his faith, it causes him to really identify with Christ if he's a true believer. When uh, we left China in 1949 and the, mission, the, the church that was left in China, we soon got some reports out. And uh, immediately when the communists took over the town, those who were really believers in Christ stayed with it and identified themselves. But a second factor set in. There was a purging of the church. Those who were simply there for the convenience of it or for the economy of it left. And a third thing happened when persons began living and dying for their faith in the midst of persecution, it inspired other people to make commitments to Christ. So good things come out of persecution. And there are some of you here, I know from talking with members of this congregation, who because of your commitment and stand for Jesus Christ, have been persecuted and alienated even by your own family. Well, good is coming from it. You're identifying with Christ. And what's happening in you is inspiring others. There are some stories which I wish I had the liberty to tell. But for the sake of not transgressing the bounds of personal knowledge and counseling, I would tell you some, uh, a couple of stories about how persons who in the midst of crisis and persecution have been so radiant in their faith that it has been incredible within this congregation. They should tell the story themselves, however, and probably in due time will. Persecution, pressure, can bring forth the most profound and beautiful Christian experience. Paul closes the section we're considering today by noting the condition of men without God as compared to the tremendous position 
that those who are believers in Jesus Christ have. And he indicates that there, when there is resistance to God, such as been exampled among his own fellow countrymen, they always fill up the measure of their sins. God's wrath has come upon them at last. And that word at last means it has come upon them to the full. What is Paul speaking of? What is the wrath of God? And how does the wrath of God come upon an individual? There are two ways we can understand what the wrath of God is. And by the way, this is one way that Paul certainly came to Thessalonica without flattery. He declared the whole counsel of God, which involves the fact that God has a day in which He will judge the world. We don't try to hide from that at all. That's a factor of the gospel. That's why Jesus Christ came, to intervene between us and the impending doom. But what is the wrath of God? There are two ways we can understand the wrath of God. The wrath of God, first of all, is the absence of God in your life. The absolute absence of God. Paul talks about it in Romans chapter 1, verse 18 and following, where he says of the pagan world, which had so sought idolatry and immorality to such a gross extent that they had so utterly turned from God that Paul says the wrath of heaven, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all manner of wickedness. Now what's that mean? That God had an x-ray gun in heaven and when someone would do wrong, he'd zap him with a piece of fire and, and get him for it? Is that the wrath of God? No. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven. What is it? Paul goes on to say three times, and God gave them up, and God gave them up, and God gave them up. In other words, the wrath of God is absence of God from human experience. The absence of God from your life. You know, God knows how to create distance. Well, when you look at this universe in which we live and start looking at light years and trillions of light years, God knows how to make distance. And if God knows how to make distance in a physical sense, God knows how to make distance in a spiritual sense. He knows how to make distance in respect to sins. As far as the east is from the west, so far shall your sins be removed from you. you can't, they can't get you through millions of light years. Never get to you. And God, who can make that kind of dis distance between you and your sins, also can make the distance between you and Him if you remain in your sins. The wrath of God. There's opportunity now to escape the wrath of God through a relationship with His Son, Christ Jesus. The second way the wrath of God is to be understood in the Scripture is through reading Revelation chapter 6, verse 16 and 17. The picture we have is the very end of time when God interposes an end to all human affairs. And great men and small men of the earth hide in caves and among the rocks of the mountains, calling to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of Him who is seated on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come, and who can stand it? What's the writer of Revelation saying? He's saying that the ultimate fear in the universe by human beings like you and me is not the fear of death. Ultimately, that's not your greatest fear. Your greatest fear is not the fear of the future. Your greatest fear is not some fear of failure or personal catastrophe. Your greatest fear is not your health. The greatest, most unresolved fear in all the universe is the fear of God. And ultimately, when God is seen for who He is, with the naked eye, you would rather die than meet God, which means that death is a lesser fear than meeting God. The wrath of God outpour. How fitting, therefore, is the word of Scripture that the beginning of all wisdom is the fear of the Lord. That is, reckoning with the fact that that is your most fundamental fear and what you must come to grips with. Perfect love casts out fear. And because God so loved the world, there need not be any fear of God in your life at all. Only reverence. The book of Revelation says, God's wrath has come upon them to the uttermost. Notice that that phrase, has come upon them, is in the past tense. And I want you to see something distinctive about a word of Scripture here for a moment. Scriptures have a way of describing a future event through a past tense verb. It's a crazy thing. It's about like, instead of saying, the world will end someday, it's about like saying, the world ended. The world ended. 
And when the New Testament writers talk about the future of God's judgments, many times, rather than talking about it in a future tense, they talk about it as if it had already happened, in the past tense. Because so certain are they of the word of Jesus that the event is going to take place, that as far as the Christian is concerned, it's not simply in the future, it's a settled thing which has happened. And the wrath of God has come. It has already been pronounced on the fearful and the unbelieving upon those who go their own way. It is an action which has occurred, which shall yet occur. But if that can be said of the wrath of God, that can also be said about salvation. We have been saved. Has that happened yet? Well, yes, it has. Is it happening now? Yes, it is. Shall it happen? Yes. We shall be saved completely, totally, free at last from any temptation even of sin, any mortal failure, totally with Christ. And so secure is the salvation in Jesus Christ that even though the consummation of it is in the future, it can be described as happening in the past. You were saved, changed, transformed. What a life to be in God and in Christ Jesus. There is no other way to live. Let us pray. How clearly your word comes to us today, Lord, in showing us the difference between night and day. How much you yearn for us to be at one with you. And your servant Paul, who was like a nursing mother in respect to other believers, is only a poor picture of how you, as our Heavenly Father, care for us. How many times you would gather ourselves to you and seek to draw us in. How much you want us to simply feel the warmth of your embrace, the kiss of your delight upon our lives. How you want us, like children, sometimes to just simply come to you and say, Papa, instead of being big and formal with the word Father, you have us say, Abba, Papa. You want us to be that close to you. And we praise you today that we can be so close to you who made the stars, the heavens, the width and breadth of the universe, that you who are so great are so near to us. My deepest prayer today, Lord, is that we would all, as people here this morning, come to a conviction, an utter conviction, of the truthfulness of what has been declared. My prayer for persons who are outside of a saving experience with you, who have never confessed you or recognized you as their own personal Savior and Lord, my prayer for them would be to come this very day into belief in you, into an experience with you which brings forth everlasting life. And my prayer for every believer here would be to thank you for what you're already doing in, in each one's life. It would also be to put into the fabric of our experience as Christians the very kinds of things of purpose and unimpeachable conduct and love relationships and thanksgiving, those kinds of things which make for a life that really flowers and matures. Sometimes you want to hug us as children, and you always do that, I suppose, no matter how old we get. But other times also you would like to see us no longer be babes, but you would like to see us coming to maturity. And so we bend our wills and our prayers to that desire, this day our Father, that we might be your sons, fully and completely, and that we might be conformed to the image of your only Son, our Savior, Christ Jesus.
In His name we give thanks. Amen.